Well, we have invited Magali Anderson. She is a head of a Olchin Group for Sustainability. She's been in this industry for 27 years, and she look at she used to look at world from all platforms. And I believe that is indeed a very unique platform. So I will invite her to come over, and I leave the floor to her. Thank you so much. Buongiorno. And that's about the only thing I can say in Italian, so I absolutely apologize on the fact that I will be speaking English now. Even though I'm French, so we can switch to French if you prefer. So thank you, I'm very happy to be here. And I would like to spend a few moments explaining what the cement industry does and how we look at the future and how we will live. And, uh, I think the first, one, the first thing I would like to address is all the mega trend and what are the challenges that we are facing right now. Some of them you know, some of them may be less. So let's start. About more than one billion people today do not have access to a proper house, do not have a proper roof on their head. More than half of that number don't have access to energy, don't have electricity in their home or wherever they live. But then if we look at the future, we have about 2.5 billion people who will move to urban areas, so twice as many as the ones already lacking houses today. And about 60% of that infrastructure does not exist today. So that's equivalent to spend the next 30 years building New York City every single month. Now, that's for the urbanization, but think about the energy transition we are going through. Think about the electrical cars and everything being electrified. So the requirement on green energies that is happening about all this transformation, about all those, um, all those uh, windmills we have to put in place, et cetera, et cetera. There is an incredible need of building in the next decades. But, so we can see it that way. I myself see it as an incredible opportunity to change the way we built. We can't do that type of mass buildings the way we've been doing it. And I'm not talking about the ancient Greeks that were mentioned before. I'm really talking about building after buildings. We need to find smarter ways. We need to find ways where we will be using less material. We talked about nature. We need to find ways to have nature in the cities. So we need, in short, to build something that will be good for people and the planet. So let's see if we have a few ideas on how we can do that. Well, I will start with the basic, which is the material itself, the product, because that's where it all starts. And what you see here is a picture of um, two trucks. One is a ready mix trucks, which is a concrete truck, the other one is a cement truck. Those are um, green products that we have launched. The first global range of green concrete, which is the Oco Pact, which we launched about a year ago. And today it's in 24 market. And there is always the question, you know, when you sell cement and concrete, is there a demand? So, it's quite amazing how much we have deployed it, but I will just give you one example because we always think of major market when we think of decarbonization. In India, we introduced it earlier this year. In October, it represented 14% of our concrete sales. So that's the evolution just in, in 10 months. Um, it has won a prestigious award of best of the best of, of the 2021 20, Sustainability Award. And the reason I'm talking about the product is because, again, it starts from there and is to show that it exists today. The New York City we have to build monthly starts today, so we can't wait for that magic innovation that will happen somehow or sometimes. We have to start. Now, concrete is one thing, but what do we do with that concrete or what do we do with that material? And I just want to give you a couple of examples here. This is Brussels and this is Living Tomorrow, a campus that is being developed. And I really like it because it, it includes a, a hotel, a gourmet restaurant, an innovation center, etc. And it's all about 
rethinking how we can live tomorrow. And you saw the presentation earlier talking about healthcare, and I think it's really looking at all the daily habits we have. So we were really happy that they used Ecopact for that building and um, with a 70% lower CO2. Uh, again, it's really how do we put our product at the service of a better living? This one, I really like it, and I think we have a, a speaker from MIT just after. Uh, this is actually Boston University, right next door, and uh, it's a, a new computing and data science. We poured it a few months back. It was the biggest pour of concrete eco pack that we have ever done. Um, 4,200 cubic yard feet, so yard cubic yard, so I'm not sure what it is in cubic meters because I'm not... Uh, so familiar with American things, but what I know is that it reduced 350 tons of CO2 in one go, which is quite, I think, an amazing number just for one building. And it's going to be the largest carbon neutral building in Boston once it's completed, sometimes next year. Um, that was, by the way, done with KPMB Architects. But so. Let's move from the products to how we built. And, and I think rethinking the way we are building is just something we have to do. It's not an option. So I don't know, some of you might have been to, to Venezia Biennale. Um, if you haven't, the bridge is still there, this Triatus Bridge. I was there myself uh, not so long ago, watching it in Riol, so you can see it. You can walk on it, you can touch it, so it's Riol. But what's very interesting about the Triatus Bridge was a complete new way of building. So we are not using 3D printing just to build the same house we were building before, but printing it instead of putting bricks or whatever on. This one, is done without any binder, without any glue, without any reinforcement. It's using compression force. Again, we were talking about the ancient Greek, it's using the way it was traditionally built, where it's just using the, its own strength to fit. And again, you can climb on it, it will not collapse. I've done it, there was a lot of people on the bridge at the same time, and we were all good. But the beauty of it is that not only we had about 70% less material that if we had used normal technology because of, of the shape inside, you know, it's not, con it's not full concrete. But because of having no glue and no reinforcement, it's fully recyclable. You can take the pieces away and you can reassemble it somewhere else. So I'm not sure what's going to happen because apparently Venezia really likes it, so it looks like it's going to stay there, which is also great for the city. It's not even on the top of, a, of one of the river, but that's okay. And it actually receives a European Cultural Center Award for Section Design Innovation. And again, is that going to be the mass way of building in the future? Maybe not, but I think it's very interesting for us to explore. It was done in collaboration. It's our ink, it's Holcim Ink, but it was done in collaboration with um, the Professor Block from ETH University and Zaha Hadid Architects. Then the other way to build so much will be to build more with less. And I think circular economy is going to be an amazing future for the construction world. Now, think about it. You know, cement makes concrete, concrete makes something, that something can be a house, a building, a bridge, infrastructure. When that something comes to its end of life, what we can do with it is we can grind it back, grind the concrete back to powder, put it straight back in cement, and reuse it in cement. We do that in, um, in Switzerland. We have an eco-planet ranch called Susteno, which contains 20% of construction and demolition waste inside. We only do it in Switzerland, purely because the norm doesn't allow us to do it anywhere else. Normally, in Europe, the norm should evolve by the end of 2022, early 2023, so you will also have it in Italy. But, but I think today, as a company, Holcim, we recycle about 50 million tons of waste that would be landfill if we don't use it, which is 
helping us to lower the CO2 of our product. What you see on the picture is a circular explorer that we launched is actually a, a true boat. We launched it uh, back in June. Um, it's going to Manila, to Philippines, in the Manila Bay, to collect plastic. That bay is one of the main input of plastic to the ocean. So the best way to, to stop plastic from going to ocean is to catch it before it goes. And it's going to catch five, four tons sorry, of plastic per day when it will be there. It's, it's on its way now. It's not there yet. So circular economy, but then we talked about nature. I think nature in the city has to become a key topic. We can't continue to have concrete. I think we talked a lot about COVID in, in a previous speaker. Um, what happened during COVID? We all stayed at home. And we all suffered from not seeing trees. The city people who couldn't get out of the city all suffered from that. And for me, it is another key challenge of, of the future of those New York cities that we have to build. What you see here is actually a true project. It's, it's such a good picture. It almost looks like a maquette, but no, it's a true project. It's in Aubervilliers in France. We have a concrete called Hydromedia, Hydromedia which is a very porous concrete, and we can plant trees in it. As, it's as good as that, because the water goes through, of course, the roots go to the bottom and, and get to the soil, but it allows to have a urban forest, and that's what we really want to look at, urban forest, green roofs, vertical forest, if we can do it. This urban forest here has several advantages. It fits urban heat island effect, so at midday, when you are there in summertime, it's about six degrees less than when you are um, in the rest of the city. But also, it absorbs up to 100 liters per second and per square meters. Think about flooding. So think about, so th they were showing for a similar product in, in New York City how um, equivalent flooding that had happened some years before took months to clean. Now it only took some days to clean. And we have to think of that. I mean, we have seen flooding events happening more and more. So that's the type of product that we can do now um, already. And then I will um, talk about affordable houses. And, and as I said, more than one billion people today don't have a proper roof on their head. But it's not just houses. It's also all the infrastructure. It's also schools, hospitals, etc. And this is actually a true house. It's a true picture. Again, it's not a maquette. Um, in Malawi, uh, sorry, it's not a house. This one is a, is a school in Malawi. That was printed in 18 hours, the walls. Took a bit longer, obviously, to finish the entire school. But Malawi has a shortage, shortage of about 36,000 schools today. With traditional building method, we estimate that is going to take about 70 years to bridge that gap. With 3D printing, we could bridge it in about 10 years. Again, it's kind of a twist of mind, because when we think 3D printing, we don't necessarily think of going and print um, schools in Malawi, right? We think more on an iconic building somewhere, somehow. But that's actually a, no, a different way of looking of how we can bridge that infrastructure gap. And the next picture is also in Malawi, and it's a house. We can build a house, we can 3D print a house for about $10,000 now, which is um, 45 square meters house, family home. And, and again, um, the, this project actually also includes financing, et cetera, et cetera, to really move on the needle on what we need. So. I don't know if you all know the Holcim uh, Foundation for Sustainable Construction. That has been uh, alive for almost 20 years now. This is actually in Venezia. It was uh, two weeks, uh, or the weekend, uh, 10 days ago, um, for the award of the sixth uh, category. And it's really something that at Holcim we are trying to do. We are looking at partnering with many people with that award to think of how will we live in the future? And I would say as a conclusion, I think today we are at really, I know it was said at the COP26, but we are at a time where it's still time to do something, but we have to do it now. We have an incredible opportunity to change how we do things, 
But the beauty of it is actually we do have the products. The products exist. We can use them now. It's a matter of, of just getting on with it. And uh, I will stop there. So, thank you. Thank you, Magali, for this impressive uh, uh, for this impressive view and presentation on how the industry, well, the cement, the clean concrete uh, industry, is now shifting towards uh, not only sustainable and innovative solutions, but they're also differentiated uh, according to the geopolitics uh, around the world. And this make me think. Well, you said in the end that the moment is now that we shall change now, but I'd love to go back uh, to, what, uh, to what Mr. Galli said at the beginning when he spoke about the relationship with culture. It looks like uh, it is easier to innovate on the industrial uh, way rather than the cultural way. Let me use this following word, the cementification. Cementification is perhaps an Italian word, and perhaps it doesn't translate into German, in French, and also in English. It means something else. And why, Magali, in your view, there is this say, culture that goes against concrete? And how can we overcome this idea in Italy? So you're right. And I think it's something we are I've been in a crazy world right now. I think we can say that where there's a lot of myths going around. I mean, we have seen it with COVID. Many people say many things not necessarily based on science. So I'm very happy we're actually in the Museum of Technology and Science because that's, you need to let science speak. When you let science speak, um, we, Holcim, I will start with Holcim first. We have committed to net zero and we did it using an organization called Science Based Target Initiative, which validates our pathway, our reduction. So. We are committing to have our uh, CO2 going to zero, but it's not just us. The Global Cement and Concrete Association came together. That represents 80% of the cement that is produced in the world. They all came together, first industry, to actually have a roadmap to zero. Now, so that's one. The roadmap to zero is one, to the, the carbon footprint of our own product. But then, again, as I was showing, you can build with much less, so you can also decarbonize. But the, the other angle is to look at the actual life of the building. So uh, a building life, sorry, I just get rid of that. <laughs> the life of a building today is, um, the, sorry, the CO2 to the, to the building environment, about two thirds happen during the life of a building. And if you look at the thermal mass of, of concrete, the inertia of concrete, you actually would lose much less CO2. So I think, what the concrete industry needs to do, and we are part of it, is how to show that we are actually the good guys. We are actually part of the solution. It's something that people were convinced, you are right, before. We have a deficit of image right now, which we need to fix, but I truly believe that people are hearing more and more the scientific way of doing things, so I think it's going to change. I hope. <laughs> Actually, I'm truly positive about what you said. And we heard uh, from, uh, uh, from Tao Dao Nando and um I have been told that when he built some of his infrastructures, he came in person to explain to engineers how would you work cement, concrete, from liquid to the material. And some of these engineers were even struggling with that. And Pierluigi Nervi, he's the poet of reinforced concrete. So there's one last question for you. So in your view, because 19 has been indeed the century of concrete. How about the 21st century? So following innovations and following the good guys working on new concrete, will it still be the century of concrete or are we expecting more innovations around this? So and you, you showed us a lot. It, what do we need in the 21st century? We need to face those challenges of those mega trends, this urbanization. We need a product that is versatile, that is recycled, that you can um, 
what, what recycle is also recycled by design, meaning that you can use it and change the function of it, because that's again what we saw with, with COVID, how people now are more in houses, how do you change the function of it? So you need to be able to move it. You need to be able to have nature in it to do urban forest. So once you need it to be fire resistant, you need it to help you fight all the weather events, to stand when there is storms and cyclones, to also help with the flooding. And once I've given you all those definitions, what is the only product that can do that? It's concrete. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your speech and presentation.